Can everyone hear me? It's always a good place to start. Um, so I'm actually going to be talking to you particularly um, about children. And actually, I just found Alistair's talk absolutely fascinating, totally makes sense to everything I do, but mine is even worse because <laughs> children's UX is even more immature than games UX and has even less money. Um, literally, <laughs> people are trying to develop in the, in the kids' sector, so I, I mainly work with kids' apps, not even like mainstream games. Um, so bearing in mind, they're trying to mostly sell these on the app store for like £2.50. Budgets are a bit of an issue, so um, they're kind of increasingly aware they need to do a lot of UX and get it right, but they are mostly none, none of them are making any money. Um, so it's a very, it's a, quite a complicated area. So a lot of what Alistair said made, made me laugh. Um, so a bit of background on me. Um, this is what got me into the industry. Um, I find the phenomenon of turn a tablet on and every child will be absolutely transfixed, totally fascinating. Um, I worked, um, uh, initially I was an engineer by training, I worked for almost 10 years at Circo Experience Lab um, as a, uh, a UX researcher, covered all sorts of methodologies. I, wasn't, I did some web, but I also did a lot of mobile and, and things in those days. Um, and uh, then I had kids. And in the same year that the iPad came out, my first child was born. Um, and I saw very quickly that he was absolutely, completely absorbed by this magical screen, and that as a mum, I really wanted him to learn from that and to, for that to be valuable, but every app I looked at, I wanted to fix, because the UX was terrible. Um, and I had a moment of madness, I'm not quite sure which, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit, I'm not sure, um, and uh, quit my job and went to set up um, the Good App Guide. So my, uh, my plan was uh, to help all the parents out there like me who were looking for apps um, by providing advice, like a witch guide to kids' apps. Um, and uh, I joined forces with someone who already did the same thing for toys, called the Good Toy Guide. And between the Good Toy Guide and the Good App Guide, we created Fundamentally Children, um, which is a free resource website. And we also provide a consultancy in the background. Um, I seem to find I spent half the time developing the website, because apparently, because I was UX, I could do all of that as well. Um, and I reviewed, I was checking the other day, um, I think I reviewed something in the region of 400 plus apps, the first one to 200 in the first 12 months, all through observational research myself, before we started. So I, I really hit the ground running, um, went a bit crazy. Strangely, my plan for a nice work-life balance didn't work brilliantly. Um, and earlier this year, I have, I also found it phenomenally frustrating that I was producing a review guide, but couldn't fix the apps. I couldn't actually go in and say, you've totally messed this up. We failed about a quarter of the apps that came um, through. So in May, um, I quit that to, to uh, focus more on the consultancy. I was doing a bit of it at the time, set up Diggles Consulting, which is essentially just me, um, uh, to support um, and what, uh, people developing apps for kids. Uh, and initially, um, uh, I, while I was still at Fundamentally Children, one of the things that got me started was that we were approached by McDonald's, who were producing an app for children um, that links with the Happy Meal. Everyone familiar with the Happy Meal? So the concept of the Happy Meal is, obviously, it, it, it takes on a brand a lot, so the packaging and things change with the brand, and they wanted an app that was purposeful and had some sort of uh, developmental benefit without being educational because they didn't think McDonald's could get away with that within their brand. Um, uh, and they, but they genuinely wanted to do something valuable. And they came to us with it, and me particularly with experience in apps saying, how do we do this? So I worked with RGA, who were the, the agency on that, and Preloaded, who were the games developers. Um, and between us, um, we created the app that some of you were playing on earlier, which I'll, I'll use as a bit of a framework for this. So, forgive me with the tech for a second. Um, I have got a video. Oh, where did it go? What's that? Yes. So, I don't know whether you saw the wording on that. So, um, 
the, what I'm trying to explain here is um, that Guild UX is really important to apps. Just let you watch. And one of the reasons I picked this, <laughs> one of the reasons I picked this is, in most cases, kids, particularly this age, have a concentration plan in about two seconds. Both the two clips I've shown are for kids that, bless them, just kept going with this problem, and, and it just makes for a great, a great clip. Um, just to make you aware, the game is over to the right. This is a game about school, and that's the school bus that's supposed to be parked outside. The entire game is over here, but she's just seen it. She still doesn't know it's there. <laughs> She's still trying to get that bus to move. Because buses move, right? This is another one. <laughs> Before I go on... How many people can see what Elsie can do? Can you see anything on here of where the rest of the game is? There's a lot of game here. There are arrows. Arrows on the sides. <laughs> so there's this entire section on the side which takes you through the different areas of the body, but all the gameplay is access through all the arrows. It's quite boring. <laughs> I'm not surprised he's bored. I'm quite bored. Is there anything else you can do on it? Have you seen these arrows? So that's basically where the gameplay is, and I'll, I won't go into the rest of that. So, um, so you can see, hopefully, uh, that there are some quite obvious ways in which... Um, Am I down there? Um, in which UX, uh, quite classic UX problems become an issue. Um, so in the first clip, um, they had just totally failed to understand that buses move. Kids, if you put a vehicle on the screen, assume it's going to drive away. Um, it's a nice, simple problem, it's a, it's, you know, but it's, it totally floored her. She assumed, and she wasn't the only one. I tested that with lots of kids. That is a very good app developing company. I don't know whether you know, but Dr. Panda. Um, I had tested a lot of their apps, and most of them are brilliant. But a lot of kids never made it past that screen um, because they were just assumed it was going to go somewhere. Um, uh, and they're just it's totally broken. And the other one, um, I've seen loads of reviews of people saying, this is terrible, it's just it's not got anything in it. Um, and as you can see, it's because no one noticed where the, all the functionality was. So there are some very classic issues um, with, uh, with games for kids. But the thing I wanted to talk about uh, here is what's very unique about when you're working with games with, for children. Um, and firstly, it's, I wanted to talk more about not just the testing part, but the user-centered design phase and, and what that looks like and how important the concepting phase is for this sort of project. Um, also, a little bit towards the end about uh, user testing and, and, and how to make that work, particularly with an agile frame, framework, which can be quite challenging, particularly for games. So, I mentioned to start with that um, uh, I'm going to use uh, you, Happy Studio as an example. Um, as I say, they were very focused on purposeful play, um, which was their buzzword for making it learning-based without being overtly educational. They wanted it to be fun first, but they wanted it to have some value. Um, they also gave us an age range of three to 10, <laughs> which is, of course, no problem at all. Um, so obviously, when you're looking at UX, there are lots of, I'm sorry, this is converted from keynotes, so everything's gone a different size. But you are, we're used to doing um, 
worrying about flow, worrying about onboarding, making sure there aren't any massive barriers in the usability. But as Alistair was talking about, you have a lot of issues with any game um, relating to how you balance the gameplay, um, the challenge, uh, the, the actual, the tricky bits, the bits that need to be tricky, with the ease of the usability. And you need to put the challenge into the gameplay and not into the usability. I remember it was a very interesting example when the Wii first came out. Um, and loads of people initially had the wand just to work through the menus. And God, that was hard work. You couldn't actually make it. You couldn't point it. People were so bored by the time they got into the game. And they worked brilliantly in the games. But there were people kind of standing there by the TV going, can I hover over that button? Um, and it, it's really important. Just make the click-throughs and the navigation needs to be really easy. Put the challenge into the gameplay. But when you're dealing with UX for children, and particularly learning games, you generally have this developmental benefit thing that rears its like ugly head. And even if you don't have an ambition to help children learn while you're doing it, you need to fit with their age. Um, and to do that, you need to understand them, plus, obviously, the engagement without being too engaging. Because, obviously, in um, games for children, if you seem to be addictive, then that's a bad thing. So again, you're trying to make it really fun and engaging, but not to keep the children too long. So what that basically means is that before you even start putting the game together, what you need to understand is what is fun? Do you have any idea what is fun for a five-year-old? Or what is fun for a nine-year-old? Or whether that is different? Um, and how do they actually play? What things do they play with? Do you know, for example, when they stop pretending to be fairies and start doing something else. You know, does, do you have an idea of how that works? And I've seen very, very good toy makers get that wrong. Um, there are um, huge changes across very small periods of a child, child's development. And the mo it's absolutely critical that if you're developing something for kids for either a broad age range or a small one, that you understand that. Um, so one of the things, the, the person I partner with at Fundamentally Children um, is a child psychologist. Um, I am not a child psychologist, but having reviewed 400 plus apps and advised on an awful lot of things, that this is stuff I now mostly know, although I still lean on her occasionally for some of the more detailed information. Um, and it's, it's really critical to understand. And what we did with the Happy Studio game, the McDonald's game, was to create a framework um, behind this app to say what we are, our ambition is to make sure that within this whole ecosystem, which is essentially um, a number of different games, um, we're going to try and hit developmental challenges and developmental learning within each of the different areas shown on here, so physical, social, emotional, creative. And it's been quite a challenge. Some of those are a lot easier than others um, to actually do. And one of the things I came across, thanks to uh, Phil Stewart at Preloaded, um, who is, I have to say, amazing and brilliant at what he does in terms of being creative and games design. So um, really good man to know if you need to do games research, uh, or get, sorry, games development, is this concept of low threshold, high ceiling, wide walls. Does anyone have any idea what this means? Anyone come across this, these terms before? No, okay, so effectively, low threshold is um, easy onboarding. Um, so being able to get to grips with the game very quickly, out of the box, immediately being able to play. High ceiling is effectively trying to be able to cover more skills. So being able to, for it to be appropriate if you're at one level, but also appropriate if you're at another level. So the most high ceiling thing you can possibly give someone is a blank piece of paper. Because you can do, it doesn't matter how good you are, Everyone can do something with a blank piece of paper. And wide walls, and it's quite hard to understand the distinction between those, these two things, wide walls is more about catering for different user types in our language. Um, uh, so it's being able to, to deal with different ways of working. And what you find then, if you're aiming for, to cover all of these, is that you need to have inline tutorials, you need contextual support, and then with kids, you need to make failure really fun. Um, to give you that ease of onboarding and the, the low threshold. Um, in the high ceiling area, what you've got to think about is how to allow um, real masters, how to really encourage um, people to get excited about it. And the, one of the most um, interesting in the children's space, particularly uh, one that has hit high ceiling beautifully, is Minecraft. Um, so uh, some of the things that people have created in there are absolutely unbelievable because it's essentially a toolbox. So generally high ceiling ones are toolbox-related games. Um, 
uh, and uh, the other option is the wide walls, which often is catering for different needs. And in kids, you have divergent problems, such as children who um, are terrified by time. For example, if, the, if you give them a one minute, they just fall apart and have no interest in the game whatsoever. A kids who like a challenge, kids who just want to be creative, and you're often trying to cater. And in our case, we were trying to cater for all three. So if you're creating a game, one of the things I would think is think about all these boxes. You can't have every game cater for all these boxes, but you can be forced to think about it and decide what you're aiming for in this space at the beginning. Um, I'm going to run out of time to show all my videos, but let me just show this one quickly. So this, and I'm going to accelerate through it a little bit. I've shown quite a few of you this beforehand. This is the inventor game within the app. There were quite a few. Um, and the nice thing about this was the um, concept of high ceiling. So what we found um, uh, with this was that because the idea here is you've got a toolbox, um, you can just do it by trial and error. But actually, the more into this game you get, and it changes quite often as well, the, um, the more um, intelligent you can get and the more um, skilled you can get at, at trying this. And this entirely obeys scientific principles. So the more you understand, the more you play around with it, the more you understand the rules with inherent within the game and become um, a master at it. And they've got failure is fun in here, so when it all goes wrong, the kids think that's hilarious. So actually, you have kids who want to fail, which is a really nice situation, and they learn through doing that. Um, and then it gets quite a good reward when it actually wins. If it's finished, yeah. um, uh, so, the other thing that's really critical to do at the beginning is um, learn from what's already out there. Um, you can save an awful lot of time in prototyping. One of the problems with gameplay is it's really hard to play a game until it's actually there. So, the best way to fake it effectively is not to, is to actually look at what other people do and learn from them. Um, so, moving on to this last bit. I know I'm short of time, so I'll be quick. Um, one of the big challenges I often get is trying to fit within Agile. So, as I was just saying, it's, it can be very difficult in gameplay, and it can be a big barrier when you're talking to people, um, saying, oh, we can't possibly fit that in, it'll take too long, our sprints are really short, we need the feedback really fast. Has anyone here worked on a GV sprint, Google sprint? I think they're phenomenally good. They're extremely user-centered. They do an incredible amount in the week. Um, so you kind of come up with a problem on Monday and you've, you're testing the solution by Friday um, with users. It's really interesting. If anyone thinks you can't fit user testing into agile development, read that book because it really is possible. Um, uh, and it is, uh, the most important thing is to plan it ahead of time if you're doing working in agile. Get the developers on board. And as Alistair said, the best way to do that normally is that the first time you work with someone, they leave it till the end. They realize that that really didn't work. I've worked with someone where we finished the sprint um, and we, we did the testing. And then they said, yeah, we think those things are really important, but we don't have a sprint in there to fix it. Do you think maybe you should have thought about that before you commissioned us? Um, but they just, a bit like Alistair, assumed it was going to be fine. They just thought it was a bit of a validation step to uh, keep their stakeholders happy. So it's really important to test early. Um, it's really important to ask the right questions to the user. Don't just test it for the sake of it. Make sure you've got a very clear understanding of what you're trying to learn from the test and then design it and what you're testing accordingly, particularly if you're at the prototype phase. Make sure you're very willing to have a very fast turnaround. Um, we do, I now do, after all the days of having kind of a month to do a user testing project, I on Saturday tested with 24 children, girls between 6 and 7 from 8 a, 9 a.m. till 7 p.m. I saw the prototype at 8. They came at 9. Um, uh, that's how long I got to prepare. Um, and I fed back to them on Sunday, and on Monday their team started working on the changes. So that's how fast we are writing a report up, but that's quite typical. We have to turn things around incredibly quickly for them to even be interested in listening to, um, to what we have to say. Um, uh, which takes me essentially to the last bit, which I know I'm pretty short of time on. So testing with kids. I could talk about this in a whole other session, so I will um, keep it really short. The, Important thing when you're testing with children is to allow them some freedom, particularly with the devices in moving around. Try and keep it as natural as possible. Um, and a lot of it ends up being observational. They tend to be very positive. So the other thing is, or incredible, you do get ones who like literally can't get them to play it because they failed once and that's the end and there's no way that you can get that child back to playing on it and they really only just want to eat the biscuits. And that's it. And you're like... Brilliant. Um, so it's, you need to have some backup plans. You need to have some total changes of tack for those children. But also you need to 
help your stakeholders to understand that just because they said it's amazing, that doesn't actually mean that that is amazing. It's a lot of it is more in the observation and the body language, and there's a lot more skill. And a lot of the skill is not just in the testing. Um, it's in the stakeholder management and how you make sure they understand what you actually learned from it. So my very last slide, summary slide. Um, the concept phase, I believe, in testing with children is absolutely crucial. You need to make sure you get somebody in there, um, an audience expert who understands kids and get as many of your, much of your team as possible to understand children and how they develop and the target age range you're talking about. If you take one thing away from this today, the low threshold, high ceiling, wide walls will stand you in good stead if you're working in this industry. Um, I really do find it extremely useful as a, as a template to go back to. Um, and finally, if you're planning and working with Agile, try to make sure you get at least two tests in, one very early on and one later. Probably not right at the end, somewhere in the middle. Um, uh, and assume uh, you will need a sprint after that to deal with the results and make sure your clients understand that. And that is the end. <laughs>